So I'll try and get us out of here by lunch so that we are not dying. Um, but my topic today is going to be data, or data, however you pronounce it. <laughs> um, so I'd have to look up every once in a while. I don't know why it's, oh, there we go. So to introduce myself, I'm Diana Moyo. I'm a senior solution architect um, with Splunk, and I focus on observability. So a lot of the uh, technicians that I talk to would be platform owners, application owners, SREs. Well, if you touch technology, I probably you know, um, have a conversation for you as well. Um, and so a lot of what I'll be talking about today is pretty much conversations that I have with my customers summed up into 30 minutes. I wish I had all day. Um, but essentially, everybody in this room and everybody that I talk to is tasked with doing two things, delivering um, software or architecture that is secure, because security is number one. And then number two, we want to make sure that it's working. It's stable, it's available. When I want to use it, it's there. So stability and security are pretty much paramount. And that's where I focus a lot of my conversations about. But today, we're going to talk a lot more about resilience. Um, I'll leave the security for another, another day. Um, so the way that we've been able to do a lot of this, which again, we've heard all the conversations so far today, um, Kubernetes is a huge, huge, huge part of, of the, the movement, um, which again, the innovations around that and cloud computing and all the good stuff, that's creating services and it's, it's allowing us to innovate in a way that we've now managed to build distributed systems. Um, I was gonna put a slide, I think we've all seen that network cables that are attached to each other and it's a, it's a mishmash of a mess and you know, we're all familiar with the, with the code, um, you know, spaghetti code. Um, so we've taken all of that out, and with the new innovations, we're able to build these distributed systems. They're fantastic. They work until they don't. Um, the next part of it is the data that now comes with all of that, right? So again, historically, the monoliths were fantastic, but a lot of them, you know, it, 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 if we had to fix something, we had to fix the whole stack. But now with the distributed systems, we no longer have to do that. We look at things at the very micro level. So we have a lot of access to data, and there's been a lot of innovation in the way that the data is collected and the way that we analyze that data. So that's making our lives easier. And then no conversation is complete these days without AI. So I had to be the first one to do that. I was trying to see who else was going to do that before me. Um, again, there's a lot of stride that has been made there, but believe it or not, AI has been around for a lot longer than, you know, the, I think the Gen AI PR team has done, has done their job well. So the last two years, all everybody talks about is AI. So I'll talk a little bit about these three areas. So why is there complexity, right? We're simplifying things. We have better technology now. So what, what exactly is driving these issues? So when we talk about distributed systems, Kubernetes being a, a foundational part of that, is the problem is not the technology itself. Right? It's the layering of the complexity with that. So as we're moving towards this newer stacks or newer advancements, we're adding it onto already terrible, you know, we have, there's a lot of tech debt already as, as the foundation of it. Um, so a lot of it is driven by that, or at least a lot of the conversations that I'm having is how then do we then correlate a lot of this together? The other part is because now we've taken whatever that mishmash was and we've kind of chunked it up into smaller bits, we have a lot more services that we need to manage, right? Um, so again, a lot of that, depending on the structure of the organization, will depend on um, how that, how, who owns what where. But now there's more of those, which means that we've expanded the footprint of where things could possibly go wrong. Right, so, and then also, again, to mention security just briefly, it's like we've opened it up to a lot of, um, you know, possibilities of vulnerabilities, right? So there's a risk around that. And then finally, there's also a lot more data coming from each of these elements, right? So if we had maybe 17 servers back in the days, now we have 1,700 containers minimum, right? So there's a lot more data coming at us at a faster rate um, every two seconds or so. Oh, it didn't go there. Um, and then let's talk about data now for a second. So when we talk about the data that's coming at us, it's not the volume itself that's challenging. That's one bit of it. But like I said, there's a lot of advancements in the way that that data gets processed and how it gets analyzed. But the challenge now becomes 
how do we then design our architectures in general or our solutioning on how we're going to maintain and manage these platforms because we have a lot of factors that we have to think about. One is if we're talking about this hybrid model, do we need our data to coexist or is it okay that you know uh, cloud data is separate from our on-prem data and so on and so forth. So that's a critical mass, especially a lot of the customers that I talk to, they, they you know, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a bit of conundrum because again, there's, there's layers into, into the complexity with that. The other part is we're running the services, obviously we want failover, we want um, stability. So then we have same services running in various locations, whether it's just different um, zones or if your business is global, you have data centers in the Americas or you have data centers in um, EMEA, which means that then we're now governed by things like latency. So are you putting a service there or are we localizing it, right? So how do we then design the architecture to be able to ensure that our customers are having the best experience? But then that also comes with things like compliance and governance, right? So there's data, there's rules around data um, that will surround that. But then also, if we just think locally in terms of our verticals, our financial verticals, APRA, you know, right? There's all of these nuances that come up that dictate how or where your data is going to live and how you're going to manage that. So that actually adds to the complexity of how we think about data within our enterprises. And then finally, we're gonna look at, but this is my favorite, I think, um, the trust factor. So we still have this separation of teams within the enterprise, right? So again, I talk with enterprise architects and I'll talk to platform owners and, and business owners. So then we're looking at this from a bird's eye view. But then in the various teams, we f still find that even with the onset of DevOps and everything agile and all of that, there's still this thing where the data is still siloed. So every team decides what they want and they send it wherever they want and they build their own structure of, of, and modeling around what makes sense for them and that's fine. But then it creates this complexity where if, there's, if we're thinking enterprise architecting, it adds a lot of you know, there's, there's a lot of gaps in, okay, so system A is probably not gonna talk to system B. We can't correlate the data, but yet these systems need to talk to each other. And this is how we run our business. Um, and so, and then also even within the teams, you'll find that maybe the developers are only allowed to look at code and not necessarily have access to logs per se. And so there's all of these silos within the data system itself that, again, are creating complexity with the way that we manage our systems. And then finally, AI, it's great, right? It's gonna take my job at some point, maybe, maybe not soon enough. Um, but the problem, oh, so this is actually helping with acceleration of things. But when we think about AI, we talk about it in a general way, right? AI is gonna do all, but then when we, what AI actually is is just computer act like human, right? But then there's nuances to that as well, which are these subclasses of it. So again, I'm only gonna talk about two, there's a whole lot of them, but machine learning, for example, right? Where there's data, there's machine, some level of machine learning. So that in itself is a class of AI. And then we have, again, like I said, the newly founded uh, Gen AI, right? Which is allowing our practitioners now to not have to be experts in whatever domain that they're working with because Gen AI is actually bringing the data closer to us. So the questions that customers would ask me, I'd be like, oh, go talk to AI. They'll be able to help you just as much because we can speak the same language. So that's great. But the challenge in this is the building of these models is really, really expensive, right? So we're seeing advancements in that. We're not quite there. There's a lot of things that AI can do, both machine learning and Gen AI, but we're not quite there yet. So again, to where we are, if we speak and freeze frozen in time, um, a lot of the challenges that we see are just because some of these advancements are still um, in incubation states. So how can we then look at the data that we have, given the challenges that we have as practitioners, as tech practitioners, and some of the limitations within our industry to then try and solve for these problems? Glad you asked. <laughs> All right, so first is actually breaking down the data. So this, again, I, I'm not gonna call anybody out, but being in observability space means that there, there's different data for different uses. So we'll start with um, metrics, for example. 
right? This is nothing new. When we talk about machine learning, machine learning is computational. Metrics are what drive that. Whichever which way we dice and slice it, it has to be some kind of numbers that our systems can work towards. So understanding metrics and understanding why we use metrics is key. If you want to know if there's a problem within your stack, right? Is, you know, how do I quickly identify a problem? Metrics is the way to go. And then we have another subset of it, which is our traces. So again, for our developers, they want access to the code or they want access to understand how their services are running. So traces come in handy for that, which is perfect because then it gives them a little bit more context. But when used together with metrics, you, you, know, you kind of know, is there a problem? Yes, there is. Where is the problem in this mishmash of you know, distributed microservices that we built? Oh, it's in service A, B, or C. So it's kind of helping you identify what the problem is and kind of narrows things down in terms of being able to start troubleshooting. And then finally, we have our logs. So again, logs have been there forever since the dawn of time. I think there's been a lot of mention of logs already today. But a lot of that is for context because, again, there's a lot of information there. When we talk security, again, logs will have a lot of um, sensitive data within them. So logs are, a protect, I, say, I say, a protected class of data. But that logs also have their purpose because they'll tell us why, uh, why the problem is happening because then we can look at the context and be able to actually uh, um, have the full story of, of what the issue is and, and so on and so forth. But knowing that, so knowing that is actually key. And I say this because it will make sense in a second. Because I see with a lot of our practitioners that there's, there's so many mistakes, <laughs> not to sound uh, grim, but I'm only going to talk about three for now. So the number one mistake, again, I work for Splunk, so keep that in mind, is using logs for everything, right? We love our logs. Logs are great but they're, yeah, don't use them for all of the things. I'll tell you why. While they are able to give us the full story and all the context and you know, the details that we need of what's happening within our, um, our environment, they can be quite costly, right? And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But when you think about if I was going to take maybe 20 entries of log, and I try to move them from your application to your logging solution, whatever that solution is. Or if I have 20 data points of metrics and I'm trying to move them from point A to point B, it's, you know, naturally when you look at the size of the, the, the payloads and things like that, there's going to be some lag and some latency in the way that the data is transferred across, right? So that's one of the things. It actually adds time to your uh, ability to be able to detect and solve problems. The other part of it too, which I'll talk about here in a second, is not just the transporting of the logs. I, again, this was before, you know, we kind of split things up and we, we had advancements in the way that we look at data, was we had to create complex scripts and complex queries to be able to read that data. And a lot of that was predominantly to metricize it so that then we can create SLAs on top of it so that we can then start to troubleshoot and, and figure out how to manage our systems. So yes, don't get me wrong. Logs are the greatest. They're very essential. But understanding the breakdown of the data and what data to use when is key. So that's one of, one of the biggest, not biggest mistake, that's one of the things that I still see a lot of. Everybody's attached to their logs. They're great. You can still have them. But metrics will make your life so much easier from the get-go. And then um, logs will kind of Take, take the story home. The next mistake that I see is, well, a lot, this predominantly developers, um, especially in the microservice world, because there's so many services, the, the teams are responsible for whichever one that they're running. And so, again, the attachment to the traces is similar to the attachment to the logs, where we find that traces, again, fantastic telemetry type, but a lot of it is, again, only developers can use that. Not only developers, but again, it, it kind of gives you context into the application side. But then if you're an infrastructure or a platform owner, traces are probably not going to be that useful. And so leveraging traces alone doesn't necessarily give you the full story. And I say this because, again, we talk to platform owners, and they're like, yes, I built this 
you know, Kubernetes clusters and all of this, and I manage them, everything is automated. And then you, you know, the, the applications get to live on this stack, but then everything keeps breaking. And so if there's no context around the two, the application team is deploying code, maybe there's, it, they're inefficiently using resources, and then the platform team is just looking at platform telemetry and going, oh, we need more CPU, we need more memory. And so there's not that cohesion between the two. And so actually being able to correlate that conversation makes a lot more sense. So again, this is, a, <laughs> this is also another one of the um, things that I see a lot of is, again, if we start with the logs, the same concept, like if you're familiar with traces, it kind of just does the correlation across the microservices natively, right? Um, but then, again, we're trying to reverse engineer our logs to mimic that same story. Again, the complex scripts that we're writing, why are we writing them? To metricize the logs and or to help us do that correlation. I, a lot of the issues that I had when I was a, a practitioner was there's an issue here, but then, you know, team B owns, um, the, the infrastructure. So I'm sending them timelines of this is where we saw the issue, this is about, you know, and then they go into their logs and they can't necessarily find it. And so when we try to do that artificially, we're losing a lot of the context. Um, so while traces are able, so again, leveraging solutions out there, there's a lot of solutions out there, I'm not gonna plug anything, but traces are actually critical in that story. But then being able to leverage um, that together with your logs will actually make your life so much easier. Um, and then this is another one as well. So we talked about cost for a, a second. So there's this, again, attachment to data, which is, which is great, there's nothing wrong with that. But when we want all of, all of our data available all of the time, and I, I call this hot stores, meaning that the data is live, it's active, it's accessible. In the, it, some, a lot of the use cases, especially when we're trying to artificially you know, con join and correlate a lot of things, we need a lot of that data to be active all of the time. So understanding the breakdown and understanding what works what, when makes a lot of sense. And it kind of helps you design your, your, you know, your solutioning around how you manage that, plus all the other things, the governance and things like that. But when we think about it, in, when we're managing our clusters, if there's a problem, we know our SLAs are not two, three weeks. Our SLAs are pretty much yesterday, right? So we wanna know there's a problem yesterday, maybe spin up new containers, do a refresh, all of that happens pretty quickly and that's the world that we live in. And so for that, you don't necessarily need your Right, for that you need data that's available now, that's real time, that's actually working as the system is working. And say maybe it takes about, you know, if we're not semi-agile, it takes about three days to, you know, release new versions of code and so on and so forth. Then we kind of need that data around so that maybe if we want to go and do a little bit more digging, we can do that. And then finally, if we want to retrospectively go back and you know, maybe understand all of that, I don't think anybody has a lot of time to do that, but just in case, then you kind of need that data still available. But to do your troubleshooting, you need real-time data that is maybe a couple of days old, right? Because if the service went down today, you're not, tomorrow is too late, right? Or a week from now, it's too late to start troubleshooting. And so, when we look at how we structure our data or where we store our data, a lot of these factors in, right? So there's data that you need right now, and then there's data that you might need to do some retrospective um, analytics. Maybe you wanna see, we've made changes, we wanna compare that month after month, or maybe you know, you're in sales and you wanna look at your sales numbers. So you can move that data out of the hot stores into something what we call warm stores, which means that it's still available, it's, it's archived, but it's readily available. And then for data, like we say, for compliance reasons, if you're required to have data for 30 years, you're not gonna keep it active in an active storage for 30 years. You could, but it's gonna be really, really expensive. And then when it comes to any kind of computational access to that data, it's going to be super resource intensive as well. So understanding where to put your data is pretty, pretty important. And I see that mistake a lot. And then the costs go up. And I think was BMK was talking about budgets and you want to do whatever you want to do. But then, yeah, the, the bill comes and, and it's a problem. So 
know your data, know what you need the data for, how much you need, the, uh, need to keep it for, and when to move that. And there's a lot of um, capabilities around uh, managing your data. And your data stores. So, hopefully that kind of guides you towards, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of like literature around the warm and, you know, and, and the storage and, and things like that. We say storage is cheap and, and all of that good stuff. But when it comes to the day-to-day -day management of our, of our environment, being able to move that across is good. All right, so third, so avoid mistakes, understand your data, avoid mistakes, and then standardize, right? So part of the challenge, again, with the way that we've architected our systems is cloud A's data is different from cloud B's data, or anything that we're running on-prem is completely different. And so when we try to then go in and patch everything, it's, impo it's an impossible task, right? So standardizing the data is really, really important. But how do we do that? Because we're buying and consuming the services from third parties of, or you know, they're very uh, technology specific. Well, I'm glad you asked. So open telemetry, right? So this would, would something hopefully most of you would have heard of, if not all of you. It is, um, if you have not, it is the second largest and the third most active CNCF project. Um, part of the goal is to, oh, there's, and, and a lot of the key players are there. Splunk, one of our folks co-founded uh, OpenTelemetry, so we're really passionate about it. But it is open source. It's very industry driven. All the key players in technology are contributors um, to this, including, well, not myself, not yet. Um, and so this project is aiming at standardizing the data, right? So that's one key, is making sure that the data is pretty, and, and defining the naming conventions of that. So the semantics that govern data are going to be, and when we talk about data, data, it is technology data. So from our applications, from our infrastructure, from all of that, open telemetry is driving towards that. And so again, we're starting to, it's, there's a big, there's been a, a lot of advancements in that, and there's been a lot of adoption that's starting to come as a result of that, and especially for folks like yourselves that are familiar with Kubernetes and how all of that works, adoption for um, open telemetry is actually becoming um, pretty rampant and pretty popular. So when we talk about standardization, it's looking at, we talked about gathering the data. So if, you're, if we're using proprietary or we're using specific solutions, the data kind of looks different and you can't necessarily make sense. You shoot timelines and you shoot snippets to the other person and you hope they can understand it. But when all of your applications and all of your infrastructure and all of your services and everything in between is sending data in the same predefined standardized format, it is easy to then store all of that data in one location. So part of the challenge now, like we talked in the hybrid environment, is the data is fine. It might be fine in the various domains and the various silos that it lives in. But then if you want to architect from an enterprise perspective and you want to be able to look at everything holistically, it helps to actually have that data centralized in one place. And open telemetry is facilitating that. It's making it easier for teams to then Right? Once the data comes in, you know how it's going to be structured, you know how, it's going, how you're going to read it, and you have access to the collective data across your entire enterprise. So it is, it's, it's one of those um, key things that we're using. So standardization is key. You don't have to do all of the work. Open telemetry is making it easy for you all to do all of that. Um, and then finally, is not necessarily data driven, but build an observability practice, right? So Olga talked about performance testing and, and how that realm comes in. And, and a lot of that is what kind of evolved in, you know, so the SREs and the IT ops and all of those folks in their specific domains, yes, the, you know, the, the role that they play is, is, is essential. And then when you look at it from an oversight uh, perspective in terms of the enterprise, having a COE, what that does is it helps with the standardization. So again, if you're deploying, um, clusters or if whatever it is that you're doing within your environments or applications, a lot of that would be automated, a lot of that will be templated. And so the COE's role, and I think, I, and I, I work with customers and I, and I help uh, practitioners understand the value of that because in our various domains, everything makes sense. But then when you look at it collectively, it, necess it doesn't necessarily come together. Um, and so the COE is one that is going to help with those practices. Uh, we heard how it takes 
three weeks to upgrade something that's specifically different. But the processes that we have in place make it very, very difficult for, um, say, our SREs, for example, if they want to troubleshoot something, but Team A has built their own um, solution, Team B has their own solution, and they have to make sense of all of it. So the COE's role is to, is to actually bring all of that together and standardize and create um, methodologies around that. And what, so the role of this is, is to do that, but the way that that happens is it, it, it kind of ensures that there's connectivity between that. But then, like I said, it also makes it easier for our SREs and our IT ops um, teams to be able to then leverage all of that telemetry that we have within our spaces to be able to troubleshoot and, and solve for some of, some of the challenges. Because we can, I think BMK is only build it and they'll come. Once they come and it's not working, it's not, it's not a good day for anyone. Um, okay, AI. So again, we've understood our data, we've broken it down, uh, we we're avoiding some of the mistakes, we've standardized our data, we've built an, a practice. But then again, a lot of the telemetry and the complexity of this new technology, I try to learn new technology every day, it's exhausting, it's, it's hard to keep up with, it's, it's you know, if anybody, like I said, if anybody has found a way to just get all of that nature. Um, data in through osmosis, let me know. But AI is kind of helping mitigate a lot of that, especially when we talk about Gen AI, for example. Um, so initially we had, we still, ha still have our machine learning um, capabilities that look at that data, especially when we talk about metrics. It's helping us um, identify things like anomalies. It's helping us find, uh, you know, do predictive analytics on the telemetry that's coming in. So that's still pretty critical because again, before that, and I was there, I had to do all of that and then take that data, put it into spreadsheets, try and apply formulas and do and, and do all the trending and all. It's, it's really difficult. So the AI that's already existing is there. And so when we start to then complicate our lives and start to maybe try and, like I said, superficially create uh, complex queries and complex scripts to then read through some of the telemetry types and do all of that, we're missing out on a lot of the AI capabilities that again, like I said, met, will probably make it easier to understand your environment and to optimize them. And then when we go into like, you know, like the end to end, like leveraging all of that and the traces together is being able to then diagnose things in a correlated manner. So I go into your website and I'm navigating from point A to point B, something happens along the line. I'm, you know, I'm, I don't need to know the intricacies of what's happening under the hood. And not everybody that's built anything on that website needs to know everything, only the folks that are impacted by that. And so the correlation aspect of that becomes critical in terms of not just diagnosing, but also um, uh, troubleshooting and, and, and fixing all of that. But then now, because that's already existing, and I'm sure a lot of the solutions that you guys have would have that built in. Now with the onset of Gen AI, it means that that data, as complicated as it is, as, it is, as much as it is, right, you can literally just go in there. And, and what, again, there's a lot of advancements happening in that and in a lot of the solutions that you have to, kind of, to help everybody have access to that data in a way that is simplified. So if I'm an SRE, yes, my domain allows me to have some specific skills that then I can go into a platform and start to troubleshoot and so on and so forth. But if I'm not, or we've talked about onboarding of new users and things like that, a lot of that then it kind of takes the guesswork out of that. I may not understand the entire um, domain, everything that's running within the enterprise, but I can easily go in there and if there's a problem, just ask a basic, you know, simple pro you know, prompt in English, like what is actually happening to this service? And Gen AI now is able to give us answers to things like that. So we no longer have to be domain experts in, you know, in everything, but AI is actually helping us get a little bit closer to, uh, to the, the Eureka moment. Um, and I, I don't know how much time I've taken, but that's all I have. Um, but then just to sum it up, um, know your data, right? Know what data is good for what, where, when. Um, avoid those mistakes. Like I said, I only mentioned three because a lot of that still happens to this day, which breaks my heart. But avoid some of those. 
Um, and then lastly, like if you standardize your data, that bit of it is actually going to drive a lot more innovation in the AI space. I say that because AI is modeled on data. And so if everything is standardized, a lot of the things that we're trying to solve will actually become easier in the realm. And so yes, we have vendors and we have um, practitioners that are building solutions, um, especially Gen AI solutions. But right now, I think we're starting to see that happening within the teams themselves. And to do that, and to actually do that effectively, it's really, really useful to have your data in a standardized manner, in a standardized format. And then when you have it collectively together, then a lot of that logic kind of comes, comes together, right? So standardization is, I think, one of those areas that we kind of need to start moving a little bit faster. And then lastly, like I said, um, your observability practice is going to kind of help stitch that together. Yes, we're all great at what we do in the domains that we sit in, um, but it helps to actually have an overlaying, like we have our enterprise architects having a, a COE in the observability space will help drive um, some of the best practices around what we do. And that is all she wrote. So, cool. <laughs>